Good afternoon. We're sitting at the Eileen Garrett Library at the Parapsychology Foundation in New York City. My name is Carlos Alvarado. I work here at the Foundation. I'm the Chairman of Domestic and International Programs. And it's my pleasure today to introduce to you Tony Cornell, which is a very well-known uh, British investigator of spontaneous cases. He has had a long and distinguished career studying mediums, uh, hauntings, poltergeist, and many other occurrences described generally as paranormal. Uh, today, he's going to discuss for us uh, the issue of investigating in mediums, one of the areas that he has focused uh, over the years. Uh, he will discuss uh, aspects from his experience, issues in you know, how to go on and do this type of investigations, uh, some of the difficulties, some of the great satisfactions that he has had through his career. Overall, he's going to give us a general perspective of what he has learned that I'm sure will be very useful for a lot of the young investigators that want to get into this uh, fascinating but very difficult field. I will leave you now with Tony Cornell. Thanks, Carlos, for that introduction. Mediums. It's an interesting subject, but it's one which one must deal with with caution and an open mind as one deals with any other psychical phenomenon. I think it's wrong to go to a medium, uh, some people do, being absolutely convinced that what the medium is going to say is coming from the other side, the spirit world. There are others, of course, who are highly skeptical, who go along and they think it's all rubbish and they're going to prove it's all rubbish. I think neither approach is a good approach for an investigator. The investigator's got to be balanced. Got to hope and mind and interpret what comes through the best way you possibly can. Now I said, mediums, there are two types of mediums. There's the mental and the physical medium. I'd rather talk at this juncture about the mental mediums because I sat with 17 physical mediums and frankly I, I'm just not impressed. It, I know a lot of people are, are absolutely fascinated by sitting in the dark and things being thrown around and tambourines, you know, and trumpets being blown and this, that and the other. And all I can say at this uh, juncture is if that's all I'm going to have to do when I come back when I'm dead, I'd rather not come back. Anyway, let's uh, deal with a serious subject. Of May I just uh, interject and ask you for, uh, for our audience, uh, have you actually seen a lot of fraud with physical mediums? Yes, I have. Um, uh, but let me say that I've sat with two physical mediums where I couldn't see how they were doing the phenomenon. That doesn't mean to say that I accepted it as genuine. Yes. I couldn't see how it's been done. It was still this, this stuff of voices coming through uh, and saying, Oh, I am dead, but I'm still with you, darling. Don't worry, I'm playing music with Mozart. Now, of course, that kind of thing. You see, when it's accompanied by music, you wonder where the music's coming from. Yeah. But it's, it still could be Ford. But I have seen a lot of that, and I'm not happy. The control conditions when I sat with these meetings would not be allowed. Yeah. Now, in this day and age, when we've got uh, video cameras with infrared where we can see in the dark and uh, that infrared isn't going to do any bodily damage at all which most mediums were not allowed they say oh no you mustn't photograph me Helen Duncan was killed by being exposed to uh, infrared rays it's absolute nonsense she wasn't and they wouldn't be either and the infrared that they're getting when they sit as I have sat with them in a centrally heated <laughs> seance room is much more than you get from the camera so I think they're being silly, they're, they're backing mm -hmm. off. And it's really, an excuse, it, it's say. all wrong, see the attitude is wrong, and it makes you wonder why they won't allow you to film them. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, look, you say that the scientific world won't take any notice of you, and they're silly, these things are genuine. Here's the, the scientific method to show them and say, well, look, how is it working? I won't talk about mental meetings, but as we're on the physical meetings, we, we'll discuss it a bit farther. Because you see, for all we know, it might be that they are practicing a form of psychokinesis, and they don't know they're doing it. And it's their belief structure that is mm -hmm. creating the spirit guides and all that kind of thing. But um, we've had a recent uh, spate of this in uh, England, uh, in the Skull Group in Norfolk. 
uh, one or two members of the society have thought that this is brilliant stuff. One or two other members who've been and seen it didn't think it was so brilliant. And the thing that I was unlucky, I didn't manage to see them, although I'd seen more mediums than most, but it doesn't matter. I've listened to their reports and much of the stuff that they said I've, I've seen before, so I know what the, what, what the background is. But they would not allow anybody to take infrared film. And again, you say, why not? Because they were claiming to be a scientific group with new methods of communication. At the moment when, started, when we started, or the group that we're dealing with them started tightening up the control conditions, it stopped. They were told by some higher voice that uh, the uh, methods being used would interfere with the communication, you see? Yeah. Now, I would like to see, with physical mediums, if we're going to pursue that, this kind of argument. If the dead can come from another time, dimension and space into this world and start throwing books around and ringing bells and moving tables, they are exercising some form of miraculous communication. Now, if they can do that, surely they can produce something that is a little bit more intelligent. I mean, just ringing bells is no good. If they've got the physical ability to do that, they should provide some better proof, and they don't. So, physical mediums, if somebody gets an opportunity to sit with one, I would certainly encourage them to do so. But to do so with caution, with politeness, uh, with common sense, and say to them, look, we're living in a different age now, you may well have got something that is fascinating, for the scientists to see, but can we not use scientific equipment to help you prove your point? Right? Mental mediums. Now, that's a, it's a different story altogether. There's been some fascinating stuff through in, in mental in mental mediums for years, which people have found it exceedingly difficult to see how they could get this information. And uh, if one sits with a, a mental medium, you've got to be polite to them because you're in, in a way invading their world at, at their suggestion and you don't want to invade it in the sense that you upset it. If they want to sit quietly, you should sit quietly. If they want to sing, as they often do, to get what they say are the vibrations up, I don't quite know what they mean by that. If you like to get everybody's mind in tune, yes, mm -hmm. participate. Um, the usual setup, as you know, is that a medium will sit in a chair in the corner of a room in a circle of people and she will sit there quietly. She will probably start breathing deeply, some form of relaxation taking place, and she will fall into a trance. And the trance is just like somebody sort of going to sleep like that. She will stay like that, or he will stay like that, a male, male and physical and mental there are male and female mental mediums mm -hmm. and their techniques are very similar. Having been in a trance, she will then, or he will then, start speaking. And I have been with uh, mental mediums who have spoken in a very, very deep voice, which sounds like that of a man. And this <coughs> is a phenomenon of interest in itself. How is that done, you see? And I've said, with a medium who has pretended, if you like, or is genuinely producing the sound of an African chief. Very loud voice, and you think, how the heck can this woman produce a voice like that? The content of the communication generally is a bit um, childish. There's nothing of any great portent comes through, and this is worrying. Uh, messages from uh, a dead husband, a dead wife, saying, I am happy now, don't worry about me, I am with you all the time. And one wonders whether this isn't some form of, um, uh, not charity, but um, counselling. And if it's counselling, and if it's giving the person who's getting that message from their dead husband or their dead wife, and if it's giving them comfort, who are you and I to criticise it and say it's wrong? But if you and I as investigators want to go into it in more detail and for proof, we've got to ask other questions, and we've got to take other conditions, and we've got to make sure, for instance, that 
that medium isn't in some way doing what is known as cold reading. Um, there have been mediums in the past who have produced, produced all sorts of communications in public. And we know now that they had sent their scouts round to people to find out all about their background and their interests and their ages and who's dead and what not, and they just sit on a public platform and put this back. Yeah. One of the oldest ones, uh, tricks in this field, and it is a trick, let's face it, it's a trick, is <laughs> to get everybody to write down a message on a piece of paper. And that's handed up to somebody and they hand it to the medium. And the medium looks at it and then he reads it, you see, and he gives the answer. Now, what is in actual fact done? He's read the message and he's said, oh, I don't know the answer to that one, but he's remembered the, the, the messages on the second one. And he then gives the answers to the person. The person doesn't realize that it was the one before. It's a trick. There's not so much of that uh, that the investigator is really interested in. That's the public stuff. What we're more interested in, as I say, is the home circle, where they're sitting in, in the dark, quietly, producing these messages. Um, proof of identity of the person who is coming through you should, I think, say, well, can you give us your address, where you were living, uh, what were your first and second names, uh, when did you die, when were you born? <coughs> These facts are available, they can be checked on, and that, I know, I've tried on several occasions, it's never come off, we never managed to get that. But people have in the past, in other areas, said that this is possible. You'll probably remember the um, um, cross correspondence cases. Yeah. You know, they're famous, they're Victorian. And they're often provided as the proof that there's a life uh, after death and that uh, a number of mediums at that time, three in all, in America, in England, in South Africa, produced written documents which were all sent to the London SPR. And the people in the SPR, there were 3,000 of these, and the people in the London SPR noticed that various phrases from these different mediums tied up. Well, I think that needs a lot of looking at, although it's held as a classic case of first-class information to provide that there is life after death. There were a lot of those documents, and some people still doubt whether or not they have been looked at correctly. Mediums uh, are interesting, um, not only from the point of view of different voices and the information they provide, but also they can, <coughs> at times, get some extraordinary information. Now, I'll just give you an example of this. I was assessing a medium in Cambridge for ESP, and she knew that it was purely simply to see whether her telepathy was, was better than anybody else's, you see. And we got about eight sittings, and we'd done six. And her <coughs> ESP results on these uh, tests weren't any higher than anybody else's. But she was doing quite well and cooperative. And I went along and she said, Oh, Mr. Cornell, I've got to give you some personal information. It's coming through strongly. My guide is telling me I've got to help you. And I said, Well, I don't really want that. I'm more interested in the experiments we could do. Oh, but she said, I must tell you this, you see. And she wheeled out. 14 main points of my life situation at that time. 14. The only help I gave her when she said, am I doing all right? I said, not bad. That's all I said to her. But what was interesting was this. I was in a, a peculiar sort of situation at that time. Um, <clears throat> I'd met a woman. I was having problems. I was having financial problems, I was having emotional problems, and this, that, and that. We all get into a situation like that at some time. Yeah. But she got these 14 points exactly right. But subsequently, I found out that the last four points were wrong. For the simple reason they were as I thought the situation was. It was my interpretation, those last four points. The first ten points were absolutely correct. The last four were wrong. So it looks as if she was probably reading my mind. Where else does she get the information from? And I would have been much more impressed if she said to me, look, Mr. Cornell, point one, two, three, four, through to ten. Huh? Now, this point, you think it's so-and-so, but it's not. 
if she'd have told me how I was wrong in thinking about those last four points, I would have thought that that was very paranormal and much more evidential. But she didn't. And this is the kind of thing you see that an investigator's have got to weigh up. Mental medium's interesting. There's a lot of mental mediums around. You've got to be very careful of the information. I think it's one of the best of the medium mystic stuff to look at. The physical mediums, as I said, I think are a complete and utter waste of time. Hey, what do you do as an investigator to, to make sure that fraud is not being done and, and that information is just being obtained by a normal invest investigation? Well, there are various methods <coughs> you can do. Um, you can send, you can have what we call proxy sittings. You see, you can get somebody to go in on your behalf and the medium doesn't know your background at all. They may know the person or they may go through and find out what the name is and uh, say, well, can you come next week? I'm busy now, we can't really sit now. And in that time, they found out who that person is and his background, is he's married, with his wife's dead, where he lives, what his occupation is, and feed it to him. But that's wrong, you see. He is being a proxy sitter. He is sending, giving her information mm. about you. That's one method of doing it. The other thing you can do is a sealed envelopes, if you like. You can put down questions and seal it up, and only you know or somebody else has a copy of it, and, it's, and give it to the medium and say, can you read this? Quite a number of mediums, so they can read it. I gave you an example earlier on of the, the fake man who reads the first one and says, I can't get it throws it away, and then of course he's giving the answers to all the other stuff he's read and everybody thinks, oh, he's getting it by holding his head, but he's yeah. read it. Common sense really is one of the main tools that you want in psychical research. You want it in most things. A lot of people don't seem to exercise common sense. I mean, you, you wouldn't go and tell a medium the, the kind of information that you want her to give you, you see. Um, there are other, other methods. You can also, if you like, make sure that you do a good um, investigation of her, what she's done before, whether she has uh, got uh, accurate information from other people, what the conditions are, whether you think that she has uh, got somebody employed to go and look at them and get the information like that. Um, the mental mediumship, is, is, is you can't really do much in the way of physical stuff with a, with a physical medium. You can, you can ask them to have their hands tied, you can make sure that they're secure in their chair, you can use all sorts of things like that. The mental mental mediumship is difficult really in many ways to control. Uh, all you can do is sift through the information that they give you and judge it, if you like, on a scale of uh, evidence. I mean, to say, uh, look, you are, I know you are feeling unwell today, or have you not, I get the message quite clear, that you've been ill recently. Well, we've all been ill recently. You want better evidence than that. I just use one's common sense. And write out the notes, if you can. The other thing, too, is to take a tape recording of it all, so you don't miss points. Another thing you can do, and this is perhaps being a bit naughty, but it's, it's a useful hmm. thing, pretend that you've forgotten what she told you earlier on and say, well, I, I, you were talking about so-and-so. Um, I, I didn't hear what you said there. Let her repeat what she said to you see if there's any variation in the story. I mean, that's, people forget sometimes what they say. The medium might forget. The medium might be making it up the first time. She might so you check it out that way. Yeah. Basically, common sense. But be polite. Don't, by any means, show that you think it's all nonsense. Uh, don't do that, because that's rude. They have their own beliefs, we're all entitled to our own beliefs. We're going there as an investigator to see whether or not they can communicate, or they can offer themselves as a medium to communicate between this world and the next. That's what we're after. And let's hope that the evidence that's come through, mental mediums and physical mediums, uh, in the next few years, a bit stronger than it has been so far. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so I take it that you have not been convinced by any communication that it really has a spirit coming through the medium? I haven't, no. <clears throat> no, because when you <clears throat> look at uh, what comes through, there's always normally an explanation as to where they got it from or how they could have picked it up. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. 
this is going back to the mental medium, uh, the physical medium show. I went down to Wales many years ago to see a chap called Alex Harris, a very famous medium. I went with a spiritualist group. I was lucky because they took me there. I wouldn't get there as an SPR member otherwise. This chap <coughs> was up in a large bedroom, the whole, everybody seated, about uh, 20 people facing him. In that corner of the room was a black cabinet which he sat in. Table over here, his son in command of everything, and he would walk up and down. He came in, was examined uh, by people to make sure he had got any ectoplasmic length of tape and this, that and the other on him. Sat in the, in the black cabinet and came out. And uh, people from Brighton were there. He knew these people had come from Brighton. And he started off by saying, I get the impression that I have some friends here from Brighton. You see? Well, he's not telling anybody that everybody <laughs> doesn't already know. Yeah, that's the obvious. Uh, now, I was told, yes, that if you came here, I was to give you some messages, you see. Well, he gives them messages and they're all lapping it up. <laughs> There's nothing written down beforehand, you see. And the other trick that this bloke did, I, it annoyed me a lot, but anyway, I kept quiet. He would go back into this black cabinet for about five minutes or three, four minutes, something like that. And this lot of Brighton all talking and saying, oh yes, now my, my, my spirit, white mist said, if I came here, it would appear. The next thing that comes out is white mist. Because the medium has heard that white mist has, has been told that he was going to come. And of course he comes out. Yeah. So that's naughty. <laughs> but they want to believe it. And I wasn't at all impressed with this. This is one of the physical mediums I said that I hadn't got much time for. But to be absolutely fair, something happened in that, me in that meeting which I could not explain. So I've given you what I think is that side, now we'll give you this side. One must give both sides. When we met downstairs, one of the people that had come from Brighton had bought a large bunch of flowers, roses, for his wife, who he said, was going to materialise at this meeting. Okay? We all knew this. When we went upstairs, these roses were put in a jar where the son of the medium was MC. The medium is in the cabinet. All these people are coming out. Then he comes out, or something comes out, much smaller, white. I'm looking at this and thinking, this, this isn't the same size as the medium. And it says to this, it says, I am here. This chap stands up, says, "My wife, my wife!" Dashes over to the to the to the roses, grabs them, goes up to this to this figure, gives it to them, which takes them. He turns to "My wife, my wife!" Goes into the cabinet. You see, this chap's waiting outside. The figure comes outside. He grabs this figure round the waist and kissing it passionately. Well, this figure begins to sink through the floor. I mean, I'm, I'm up on my chair like this looking at it, you see. <laughs> there's a red light down. Everybody's transfixed by this. And he ends up, as the figure goes down apparently through the floor, his hands go from the waist up to the shoulders and then up to the head, and he's kneeling down on the floor kissing this as it goes through. Mm. Now, I'm not blind, and I can see this. And I, how it was done, I don't know. Maybe there was a trapdoor. I don't know. So there's something going on there. Yeah. And if, as I said earlier, if you, we'd had a film of all this, we could have played it backwards and forwards and found out. We weren't allowed to examine that part of the, of the floor afterwards, which I'd like to have done. I'd like to take the carpet back. But it went straight through the floor as far as I can see. And I'm fairly critical. You see? And other people saw the same thing. How do you explain that? That's the kind of thing that the psychic research has got to be very careful with. You've got to make sure that he sees that, that he's honest in his explanation, and perhaps with some equipment can advance our knowledge on it. Mediumship is still fascinating. But don't believe everything you are told. Because if you go to a medium, not as an investigator, but if, you, if you're going, what are you going for? Are you going because you left, lost somebody? Is it counselling? If it's counselling and it makes that person feel better, who are, are we to criticise? We're the investigators who want to know how it works, does it work, what is involved, can it be repeated, 
what is the strength of the message, is it evidential, is the medium a fraud, is the medium genuine, does the medium believe in this, is it something that the medium has that makes this happen? We have got to be even minded. Keep a complete record of it, write it up, go back again if you can, discuss it with your fellow investigators and if possible take one with you because two pairs of eyes are always better than one. Yeah, yeah I see what you're saying. Let me ask you, now that you're talking about the precautions that should be taken, as you know here in the United States in recent times there has been a lot of recent interest in mental mediumship, especially because of some TV programs of mediums that yeah. have an audience and they just yeah. walk around yeah. giving readings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would be your advice to, to people about how much can they accept about those messages? Who are, uh, what should they think wh while they're watching those performances? I think they should be very careful because it is showmanship, most of it. And you can see it's showmanship. And a lot of those people have in the past been shown not to be honest. I'm not naming anybody, mm -hmm. but we know that they have been shown not to be honest. And it's showmanship. They are in some ways, I think, feeding on people's emotions. Uh, there have been accidents, people have died September 11. It's a shock to the nation, understandable, a lot of people lost want to be in touch with people. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of situation that a person who is not really being honest can take advantage of. And if you want to believe something, if somebody is badly hit emotionally having lost someone, uh, they will be, I think, more inclined to want to believe a man or a woman putting on that show. Maybe and it's understandable, perfectly understandable. They must go to those cases and look at those television shows with caution in their mind. Is this just showmanship? Where is the evidence? Where has the evidence been obtained from? Is it sufficiently strong enough for me to believe that that evidence is coming from whoever it is I think it's coming from? But I would be, there have been too many cases where it's been sheer fraud. Be careful. Use your common sense. Keep your feet on the ground. Look at it and say, well, there might be something in it, but I'm not going to be taken in completely. Yeah. And I agree. That's very good advice because we get a lot of calls mm. and requests for information about yeah. this type of performances. Mm. And certainly, you know, we agree completely with what you're saying that people have to be careful and yeah. be a little more yeah. critical. Yeah. Another thing that people ask us is how do mental mediums work in the sense of how, do, how they get the information? Like they ask, do all mediums fall in trance? Do they all see spirits or talk while in trance mm. or not? Could you say more about you know, how the information mm. comes and mm. the different uh, trance Well, they generally levels. start off by sitting quietly and they go into, fall into this trance state, which is a sleep, type of sleep. And the suggestion is, they say, many of the mediums, to, I, I, I've sat with the medium who said, wait, wait, wait. They're talking to, they think, or they may be talking to spirits who are lined up and wanting to use their body and their mind, uh, their voice, uh, to speak to the audience, you see. The suggestion is that the spirit, the medium somehow opens up their mind to the other world and the, the uh, spirit comes along and uses their mind for them to use their talk glands and everything else, make them talk and they, the messages come out in the voice of the medium. Sometimes, as I said, I did uh, mention earlier that I sat with mediums with a very deep voice. Where that comes from I don't know. But the majority is just the medium's voice being used by a spirit, giving evidence. But I, honestly, most of the cases I have sat with, most of the mediums and most of the cases I've uh, listened to, the evidence isn't that strong. It is Hello Mary. Mm -hmm. And the medium knew that there was a Mary in the family. I, I, I'm with you all the time. Maybe comforting to that person, but is it proof? You see, it's not strong enough, I don't think. I say in this book, why is it that um, we don't get when a medium goes into trance, somebody comes through and says, 
My name is Jova Smith. I lived in 14 Butchers Lane, Wallyhall. I died at the age of 64. I had an illness for three months. My wife, Mary Sonso, looked after me. My doctor, Peter Stevens, also attended me. I went to school at Sonso. Now, these are all facts that could be easily checked, but we don't get that. We get little snippets. Yeah. And you think, you can see people sometimes saying, ah, well, yes, that could apply to me, but it's not always strong enough. So one must, I think, with a medium, if you're going to take them seriously, insist, if you can insist, that they give you definite dates that can be checked. Now, I'm afraid I must say to you that we do did this years ago, and I've wasted a lot of money going to uh, people to get um, birth certificates and whatnot, and they didn't marry up. Hmm. So I haven't had that. But there are people who claim they have. So you're saying that you got some information, but you could not check it out no. against the birth certificate? No, not clear enough for it to be absent. You're a little snippet. Yeah. And you think, somebody who wants to believe will say, oh, yes, look, look at this. But that's not good enough. You want more, more, more. You want the same kind of thing that you would get if you went to your bank and said, I would like to know how much money I've got. You'd like it all written out. It's no good you going to the bank, you wouldn't accept, I wouldn't accept, if the bank said, oh, I think you've got 25 pounds in your account, of 63 dollars. You don't want that. You want a piece of paper that tells you exactly how much you've got. Yeah, it's no good going to a medium who says, gives you a little bit of the equivalent to the 60 dollars and then give you the rest. Mm -hmm. But if you want to believe, you'll accept that. And this is a problem, you see. So one must insist upon the maximum amount of information if you're looking at this as an investigator. I've said earlier on that there are two, two fields. A person who's lost somebody and who's heartbroken and goes to a medium and gets information that makes them feel better, that's not doing any harm. It's what I call bereavement counselling. But that's all it is. As an investigator you want something else. You want more detail and more facts under strictly controlled conditions. But the strictly controlled conditions are difficult to apply to a mental medium. Physical medium, yeah. yes you can. Yeah. I hope I'm not putting anybody off. I wouldn't dream of putting anybody off because it's a subject that requires further detailed cooperative investigation. And there are mediums around, if you approach them properly, they will cooperate. Yeah. No, I, I certainly agree, and in fact, I think all, all these uh, cautions, I think, are very important to emphasize, especially to new people that come into the field, mm. that this is not, really, you know, a simple task mm. of, it's not just a question of sitting and accepting everything that you receive, but you have to be critical and you have to, mm. to, to be aware of other possibilities. I'm afraid one does have to be critical. It, it, it doesn't sound right, but uh, if there was something uh, odd, uh, that was not normal in other parts of life, you, the average person will be critical. So why should you not apply those same standards to something else that would is peculiar to something which is even more peculiar? The claim is that there is a life after death and that mediums can act as a medium for the transfer of information from the other side, which is often called to you and I who are living. Well, this is momentous claim, and therefore it needs momentous evidence. And we don't yeah. get the momentous evidence, <laughs> I'm afraid. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel talking about this type of evidence, about the records from the past? You know, as you were very well known, there have been many famous mediums like Mrs. Piper, Mrs. Right. Lerner, yeah. Mrs. Garrett. Uh, going back into, into those records, will you say that at least some of them have good evidence of some paranormal communication? I would say so. If you go through the SPR, the societies, the two societies, and your organization too, you've got uh, a lot of evidence and a lot of archives. There is evidence of something that you can't dismiss. But I'm still not happy that the evidence even received by uh, Victorian ancestors who were very, they had a very high standard and they wanted a lot of detail, but I, I still think that a lot of it would not 
come up to a sufficient standard for you and I to say, yes, that is solid evidence. Let me put it this way, it wouldn't stand up in a court of law. Nobody yet has gone to court and won in a case like this where they are claiming that evidence was given by a medium to them or somebody has said a medium has been a fraud. The medium hasn't won, has been considered as a fraud, nobody else has won. Now if you're prepared to accept the standard of evidence in normal life and this kind of thing goes before a judge and jury, if you like, or a court and they throw it out, surely you must accept that. Not one case. We had, as you know, in England a long time ago, a woman, Helen Duncan, who um, was allegedly giving information about a ship that was sunk during the war. If any of you remember that. Now, she was caught out fraudulently several times and she was taken to court and she lost the case. And there were a lot of people there prepared to give evidence for her, but it was thrown out. Now, if we're prepared to accept a court of law's evidence, we've got to accept the same standard that that court requires for a claim as momentous as I said that there's a life after death and somebody is communicating. Another small point, you and I and all these people are interested in mediums and life after death. We're human beings. We are animals, are we not? Intelligent animals? What about all the other animals? Do they get uh, messages from life after We're not interested in that. We're human beings. We're rather a conceited lot. We think that maybe we think we're the people that survive. Hmm. No matter about the cats, the dogs, but in this book and in other people's books, there are cases where quite clearly animal apparitions have been seen. They have come back. Now, they're mainly confined to uh, domesticated animals, horses, cats, dogs, rabbits. I know one of a rabbit, of a, of a canary, it's a bit odd one, but never mind. They're domesticated, they're in the human scene. And many of these ghosts, which if you like, are probably the best evidence ever of a life after death, never mind what mediums say. If we take these cases where people have seen Bill Smith walking around and they knew that Bill Smith died three months ago and they were at his funeral, and there are dozens of cases like this, as, as you and I know, that's strong evidence. But most of those cases of the animals are in the apparition scene of human beings. There's the human being the horse, there's the human being the dog. But also the, the living dogs react to those things. So they are seeing something. Yeah. And what I'm saying is this, that the medium that we are looking at and wanting all the evidence for is saying that she's providing evidence of the human life after death. What about the other animals? I think it's a question that mediums might address themselves to. Yes. Okay. Well, the, the final question that I would like to put to you is that uh, you have expressed your doubts, you know, about a lot of mm -hmm. many cases and explained, you know, some of the problems. Uh, what would be your advice to newcomers as well as to current parapsychologists about what to do with mediums if we are going to get better evidence either of paranormal functioning in general or of survival of bodily death in specific? Do you have any ideas? about I what type of procedures, yeah. what type of studies yeah. you would like well, to be I, I think what, what one, one has to, you can't examine the mediums unless you get their cooperation. And unfortunately a lot of mediums are hostile to the scientists because the, hostiles, the, the scientists are hostile to them. Yeah. And what one has got to do is befriend the medium and, and be honest and say, look, we are interested in this. But you will understand that it is a momentous, it is a momentous thing you're claiming. Uh, can we work with you? Would you mind us working with you? We want to be open-minded. We want you to provide stronger evidence. You surely must understand you yourself in another walk of life with more stronger evidence. Come in. Let us, let us cooperate. Don't let us remain apart. Don't let us have this hostility. Oh, some of us are critical. But other people are critical of other things in life. That is life. There are mm. people are critical. There are people who believe. There are people who are sympathetic. 
but let us get together and see if we can develop some new form of cooperation. Let us see if there are people the other side. Look, you surely understand when you were alive that it was a difficult thing to accept that there's a life after death. You're over there now. Can you not bring in new evidence? Let us develop a new means of communication. Let us use, uh, perhaps, the mind of the medium to affect instrumentation. Let us try anything that can be shown as proof that the human mind, the human body, couldn't be responsible for it. That's the evidence that I would like to see produced, and that's how I think people should operate in the future. If, now, what I'm saying, people might not agree with, but that's what I feel, and I've been looking at the subject now 55 years. I would certainly like stronger evidence if it was possible. But I don't think at my age I should get it. It's up to the people who are coming along to be sensible with it, enthusiastic with it, and cooperate with the medium and explain to the medium, look, we would like you to work with us and get better evidence. That's all I can say. There's one thing, Carlos, that I think I've left out and should have included if anybody wants to sit with the medium, and that is the mediums have, they claim, a doorkeeper, a spirit doorkeeper. And that doorkeeper is to protect the medium from evil spirits or evil influences. And it allows, if you like, the good spirits to come through to the medium, to use the medium's mind and body to produce these messages. I think that's a thing that an investigator has got to take quite seriously. It's no good saying to a medium, I hear you, so you have a doorkeeper. I mean, accept it. Mm -hmm. Because if the medium doesn't accept that, there will be no messages at all. And one, as an investigator, has got to look at the psychology of the medium as well. They anticipate that if they don't have protection from a doorkeeper, the evil spirits will come and take them over and do all sorts of things and say things. And I've sat with quite a few mediums who have had door, meet door keepers. And if they can't get the doorkeeper there, they won't cooperate. That's understandable. Is there any similarity between the doorkeeper and a, and a control, a spirit control? Is there any, con is there any relationship? Yeah, well, I'm asking if, if that would be the same thing for you. When you say doorkeeper, yep. you're also referring to what other people will call spirit That's control. That's right. The, the, the name is a doorkeeper. It could be a higher self. It, it's something that is the other side that yes. is protecting, that is, if you like, acting as a medium, the other side for the medium, mm -hmm. this side. It's yeah. a protection me mechanism. And I suppose, in, in many senses, that is the kind of thing that you would expect. I mean, we have policemen to protect us. Yes. <laughs> right? We have front doors with keys. And if there is such a thing as the spirit world and spirits are coming, there are evil people who die just the same. Maybe they're evil after death just the same as they are alive. So they, yeah. they, the medium, if they're going to negotiate with the dead, they want some form of protection. And that is what the doorkeeper is, the higher self. Also, the physical mediums have um, uh, guides. Uh, I sat with one for many years and I had a little girl as a guide. And it's a fascinating, this particular thing. The medium would start speaking in this little girl's voice. And this little girl could not pronounce, pronounce, I can't do it properly, but she couldn't pronounce some long words. It was really funny. Hmm. And she would say, I'm having a diffy, di you mean difficulty, di di diffy, she couldn't do it. And I'm not doing it well, but there was some, she t the words are turned backwards. And it's most convincing. Yeah. But, now, here comes, if you like, the skeptic. That medium had no children. And the one thing she wanted all her life was a child. She couldn't adopt one. She has a spirit child. But, that's no criticism if the messages being brought by that child through mm -hmm. that medium are something that is fascinating in the way of proof of a life after death. But it, it, it's focusing on the medium. Yes. Why has the medium got a child as a spirit guide, a protector? See? 
We've got to look at this thing in a human sense as well as other senses. And we've got to accept that there have been mediums since time immemorial. I mean, they're, they're mentioned in the Bible. They were known in Greek times. They were known in Roman times. And they're known today. But, I would say the only proof, again, of life after death, if it is proof, is the ghost. The only proof. That's why you and I as investigators have got to find further proof. Okay. <laughs> All right. A lot of your comments I think will be particularly useful to newcomers to the field, to people that really Absolutely. want to make up their mind about all these mysterious phenomena. Mm. Certainly that there are many precautions and many issues to consider. And I think you have presented a very good summary of all the problems and things we have to consider. So on behalf mm. of the Parapsychology Foundation, I would like to thank you. It's been a pleasure.